and welcome to the Empower From Within podcast. I'm so happy to have you here today. How are you doing? Thank you for having me. I'm doing great. Thank you. I'm, it's an honor to be here. For starters, do you want to let us know what was your journey like and what led you to becoming a stress and anxiety management coach? Yes, absolutely. So they say you should teach what you know. And I have known anxiety since I was eight. I had my first pan, it probably soon, probably before that. I had my first official full-blown panic attack when I was eight years old in the middle of a crowded restaurant. And it was awful. And I have dealt with anxiety, depression, PTSD, burnout throughout my life. The burnout was the latest one. That was nice in my 40s. Um, but yeah, anxiety, stress. Uh, I've always been fascinated with the the so so this experience led me to have a fascination with what was going on with me why was this happening because I wanted it to never happen again and there was a lot less resources back then than there is now um regarding all of this and understanding about why this is happening you know I I see this all the time where <clears throat> doctors will tell people oh you have an anxiety disorder well, in my perspective, my body, my nervous system was reacting just the way we were meant to evolve, but we weren't meant to have all of these um, stimulus going on all the time. You know, our, our nervous systems evolved over hundreds of thousands of years for lions and tigers and bears, not social media and mother-in-laws and taxes and, you know, news 24 set, like all the things now of our modern age are overwhelming to our systems. And even back then, when I was, you know, eight years old, what was going on was overwhelming. So I wanted to understand why this was happening and how I could reel it in and understand it and heal from it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Wow. Thank you for sharing. I have so many things that I can pull off from just that <laughs> yeah, little snippet no. of what you said. Um, I think I'd first like to go into like, what exactly does a panic attack feel like? Because I've never had one, or at least I don't believe that I've had one, but sometimes when I hear people explain it, I'm like, oh my goodness, is that really what it feels like? So can you explain like, what did it feel like when you were eight years old having a panic attack? Yeah. So I'm sure you've heard of like the fight or flight response. Yeah. So we have two parts, we have two parts of our nervous system in terms of, of leveling up or, or calming down. We have our sympathetic, which is fight or flight. There's now added to it, feign or freeze, fawn or freeze, sorry, fawn or freeze. And then we have our parasympathetic, which chills us out and brings us back to normal. So within the fight or flight, uh, fawn or freeze response, panic attacks are typically feeling like you're going to die, like something is really, really wrong, and you want to run away or hide. And for me, it was I was a runner. I was I was in this crowded restaurant. All of a sudden, I felt like I was going to throw up. Uh, because my nervous system was overwhelmed, I was then thinking, I'm going to be embarrassed if I do this in the middle of a restaurant. I got to get out of here immediately. And so I wanted to run away. And the, and, the, and the typical panic response is like overwhelming fear. Fear so overwhelming that you feel like like something like is going to happen that's horrible. However, your conscious mind is going, I'm sitting in a Starbucks or I'm in my living room. Why is it? Or in my office. Uh, why is this happening? And it's debilitating. It's really, really horrible. You would know if you had one. Um, I'm sure all the audience members that are listening that have go, yeah, 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 that's pretty similar. I mean, within different people, it could manifest slightly in different ways, but that's generally overwhelming fear of a perceived threat, whether real or imagined. Typically in this day and age, they're imagined and your brain doesn't know the difference. Mm -hmm. So if you're thinking like, for me, that little kid, like, oh my God, the, the 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 conscious thought of it wasn't that big of a deal as I'm explaining to you like oh you're going to throw up in a restaurant big deal but at the time I was freaking out and I needed to get out of there mm -hmm. that's it in a nutshell <laughs> yeah well I think too like the subconscious mind it doesn't really know the difference right it does there's no reasoning with the subconscious mind so if it feels in danger, like it's in danger, it doesn't really matter what it is on the external world. And I think that's why we can get so caught up in stress in today's world, because like we see a movie and we're like, oh my God, and then we feel it within ourselves. And it just, you know, we're creating the stress for ourselves. Um, I like the way that you're putting in talking about like in the modern age, we're not getting, you know, uh, chased by saber toothed tigers anymore, but we're still stressed. And I did hear something. This was a while back. Um, I was listening to another podcast. I forget what it was called though, 
Um, but he was, he was saying how like our bodies, we would have probably adapted to being stressed because like, you know, it's almost like a natural response. Like when we had those saber tooth tigers, like we would feel stressed so that we can run and get out of there. Right. Um, but then we would have that pause to be able to like calm back down. And if we were like given like little drips of stress for over the next, you know, hundred thousands of years, we would have properly been able to adapt with that kind of stress, but we've kind of like just overloaded our system with like all kind of stress now. And now we're having like a real hard time managing it all. Like, what is your take on that? What do you think? Uh, and what is like, causing us to be in like such stress nowadays well you you kind of hit the nail on the head um if you have a refractory period so let's take a an animal for example because stress in and of itself is not bad it's just life if you look at my my dogs love to chase squirrels you look at little squirrels as soon as they think there's a threat they're going to run up the tree they're they're bought so when you go into that fight or flight your your energy goes to your limbs your, it goes away from your internal organs so that you can run away, so that you can fight, so you can defend yourself. It's your body. Your body wants to protect itself at all costs and wants to keep you alive. So those we evolved for those kinds of threats. It's happened so rapidly to have all of these technological and sociological changes in the past, you know, even 500 years where our bodies have not caught up. So they're still reacting as if we're on the plateau, or sorry, the, the plane's getting chased by some kind of animal when we're not. And if there is a refractory period, so say you picture an animal, picture a gazelle being chased by a lion, nearly dies, runs away, its body saves itself, the fight or flight response, the, the uh, sympathetic resp response kicks in, saves it, it gets to a safe spot in the forest. Animals will actually shake. They will shake it, literally shake it off. And that is the body's way of resetting the cortisol, the adrenaline, all of those hormones that changed in order to make it either super fast or super strong or very aware. And, and it's, the, it's the refractory period where that little animal's body is going back to homeostasis. So we're going from stress, we're going back to normal, everything's okay, we're safe. Well, in this day and age, you can imagine all the little things we respond to, traffic, bills, taxes, fight with my spouse, social media, I've gained weight, I'm getting older, you know, all the picture, all the little things and even some bigger things where we never get to come back down again to be at that homeostatic level. And so my work focuses on helping people learn different natural techniques to, to bring their body back to that. Um, I write about and talk about, I love Xanax. It's very effective. It's also only meant to be on it. You're only meant to be on it like a couple of weeks it's not a permanent solution. Any kind of anti-anxiety medication that doctors will prescribe are not weren't the solution for me. And they're not meant to, you're not meant to be on them for a long time. So I became really passionate about this when I was like, I gotta take the the bull by the horns. I gotta, I gotta figure this out for myself because no one's coming to save me. Mm -hmm. Yeah, for sure. Do you want to share like what's a practice that like maybe your go-to practice to help? relieve that stress I mean obviously we're not animals so we're not just gonna like shake so how can we really relieve that actually it's it's interesting that you say that because one of the I used to be a professional actor and um when I was training in New York for theater I took a class on voice which is not singing but is more using the breath to speak on stage and one of the techniques that I learned from a professor from Harvard was literally to shake Okay. was to do certain static yoga poses where you get to the point have you ever like worked out so hard that your muscles are shaking right yes you're you're pushing them past their strength point and that was mm -hmm. this technique so it was literally and afterwards you felt really relaxed because you shook off the energy from your limbs um my favorite technique which your listeners can get a free video tutorial of on my website I'm not going to mention here, but I have many others. It's not, that's not the only one, but they can sign up for my newsletter and get an instant download of that tool. Okay. Um, what are, what's another one I can mention? There's, you know, there's a lot of different somatic exercises that, that pause, pause the brain, pause that sympathetic um, nervous system response. One of my favorites is called bilateral stimulation. So you can do this in many different ways, but one of the easiest ones I can show you here 
is, and it seems really simple and it seems like it wouldn't work, but it actually does. You have to do it for a few minutes, but you just start bilaterally tap, bilateral means two sides, tapping your arms. And you can do this on your shoulders. You can do it on your legs if you're on, like sitting at a table, but for ease of seeing it. And it's what it does, this is very similar to EMDR, if people have ever heard of that, which is a different technique done with a therapist, but it's meant to calm the body down and bring you back into like the present moment. And so there's a lot of different ways of doing that. Um, that's one of my favorites. And you kind of give yourself a little hug and then you're kind of mm -hmm. going like, go faster or slower, whatever feels good, but it, it brings you back. Um, and it's what I teach are lots of different tools, basically like a toolbox, because not every tool is going to work for everyone at every single time. Um, there are different stress responses. For example, there's the fight or flight. Then there's also the freeze, which is like shutdown or burnout or depression. So the more we understand this, the more we can take control of how we're feeling and enjoy our lives. Because to be honest, Jessica, my little nervous system and my responses to my life got in the way of a lot. It got in the way of dating and auditions when I was acting and, you know, how I felt about myself. And um, I don't want other people to suffer like I did. So that's why I do what I do. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Do you feel like you could really overcome stress and like some of the, you know, long-term effects of stress? Is it actually possible to heal from that long-term? Oh, 1000%. Absolutely. You just have to be able to take yourself out of the immediate response, right? So like the thing that is the thing that is not well is the thing that's in control, right? Your brain is in control and, and your brain is hijacking your body and or your body's hijacking your brain the reverse. And that's like, you have to stop and go, okay. And that, that takes practice, but you can absolutely heal from from the effects of it. And you're never going to stop. Let, let's face it. You're never going to stop your stress. That's life. That mm -hmm. stress, stress is there's six types of stress. I always have to write them down because I forget them. There's six zones of stress that I teach actually. Okay. There's physical, um, which is like uh even lifting weights is a physical stress, or like getting sick, like a, a virus or bacteria. There's social, which is like our, you know, our relationships, environmental, which is like where we live, our town, our home, our city. Um, existential, which is like fear of death, or if you're dealing with, you know, uh, dying, mm -hmm. um, emotional, which is what we typically think of as stress and then, and mental as well. Um, so there's different ones and in and of itself, they're not bad. It's when they stack upon each other and we don't have that ability to come back down where it gets overwhelming and can lead to disease. I, I firmly believe, you know, there is no disconnect between the body and the mind every degenerative disease, doctors will tell you, start with stress. And I delve into that. I, I teach my, my um, students like why that is. Basically, when we have that response, that stress response of fight or flight, things happen in our body, certain stress hormones are released, our inflammation goes up. This was really interesting when I learned this, like picture someone running through the woods away from a predator, our inflammation goes up, say so you get cut, well, inflammation in the short term will heal that really quickly and stop the bleeding. Inflammation long term chronically is not good. So it's really important to understand like why this is happening and then thereafter how you can utilize that information to feel better. I really I think appreciate I gave you, you long saying response that. to one question. <laughs> no, it was perfect because you know, I feel like inflammation has really become like a negative word right now. You see oh. inflammation, you're like, oh my God. But to really look at it and be like, actually there's there's a beauty to it. There's a helpfulness there's a, to it. There's like a reason. Yeah, yeah, there's a reason for it. And like, it's, it's so it's when it's chronic. Yeah, there's certain things like stress by itself. We're like, oh, bad yeah. inflammation. Oh, bad. It's actually not. It's when it's over the long term. It's it's mm -hmm. our body. When you understand this, it makes total sense. It's our body's response to the way we used to live. And we have, our bodies have not had the chance to evolve now to what we're doing in our mm -hmm. technologically and in our societies now. So okay. it's putting it into context. Yeah, for sure. I'm just curious because, okay, the, the example that we predominantly use about the past and we talked about it, about, you know, the fight or flight response when we're being chased by a saber tooth, like our ancestors, that was a stress and then they'd go and hide or, you know, even the animals. 
How do you think that our ancestors would have dealt with emotional stress? Because when we're talking about being chased, like that's a physical stressor, right? So it makes right. sense that when they're well, in safety, the they can decrease it's a, that. it's a combination. It's actually a combination oh. of like existential, like death. Right. Okay. Yeah. Physical, because you're having to run or hide or, you know, mental, you have to think like, do I go up that tree? Do I go in that cave? Mm -hmm. Do I jump over this cliff? Like what? So it's a combination. Right. Uh, so your question is, how would they evolved? How would they have dealt like, with emotional stress? Yeah. Let's say they were having relationship challenges. <laughs> like, how do you think they would have <laughs> responded to it? Then? I don't think they had the capacity. If you think about okay. like evolutionary wise, like we, our, our societies have changed. If you think about how like, gosh, we used to have horrible things like slavery and you and I used to be property. Mm -hmm. Right. So like, and right. we, we used to just deal with that. Like, this is the way. So it, uh, I don't think they had the capacity. And I think that's one of the things that makes our lives so complex because now we do have endless choices. We, you know, at least let's speak as women, like we can work, we can have families or not. We can, at least in the Western world, we can choose where we want to live, how we want to live. You know, there's a freedom to that. And there's also like an overwhelming, <laughs> overwhelming choices. So I think, to be honest, I think we're, we're all doing the best that we can given what we know. Mm -hmm. And it's going to continue to evolve. Um, yeah, I, I don't, I don't think they would have been able to. I think that <laughs> they did the best they yeah, could. Yeah, no, that makes sense. Yeah, for sure. No, I appreciate that, and that's something that I say on the podcast pretty, like, pretty often too. That you know, each of us really is doing the best that we can with the knowledge that we have, and um, you know, as human beings, I think we're wired to do the right thing and what we think is the right thing for us at the time. I want to get into the nutrition side a little bit, because you, like you said, you used to be the co-host of the podcast, Food Heals podcast, mm -hmm. um, and you also have a CBD company. Mm -hmm. And so talk about nutrition and like, how does nutrition help us relieve stress and anxiety? Yeah. So our nervous system needs certain nutrients to be optimal. Um, and if you are constantly dealing with stress and not getting those nutrients, you're going to feel worse. So one of the ways, you know, I teach a body, mind, spirit approach. Um, I, when I was let down by Western medicine and like, here, just take this pill. Oh, we're going to take this away because it's really addictive. And I, and you can't be on it forever anyway. It's like, okay, well, what else does my body need? I, and I've always been, I was raised with a mother who valued nutrition and supplements and gave me green juice when I was, you know, two, this was 40, over 40 years ago. Um, and then being the co-host of the Food Heals podcast, like I just always knew that that was really important for the body. Um, that podcast was specifically about how people heal themselves when they were told there's no, you're good luck. There's nothing we can do for you. And, no. um, there's many things you can do to heal yourself, regardless of what you're dealing with. I, I know that. Mm -hmm. So, um, to supplement for high stress. One, the first thing I always tell people is, are you getting enough magnesium? Magnesium is a water soluble mineral. You need it. Um, if, and if your body doesn't get enough of it or you get too much, it'll flush it out. Like you can't overdose on it, but you need it. Our people always say, oh, you can get it from your food. Not really. I, I think that our, the way that our fruits and vegetables are farmed, they're picked early. The soil is not wrote, the crops are not rotated. Uh, they're demineralized. So you need to supplement with minerals. Um, I love taking this one supplement called Calm. It's a powder. It's delicious. It's raspberry lemon flavored. You mix it in water. It's instant, you know, magnesium. And it will really, it relaxes you. I take it before bed. If you've never tried that, I, I, I'm i telling your listeners, go and try some magnesium and see how you feel. You're going to be like, whoa, I did not know how effective this is. It's really, mm -hmm. really good um, supplement to take. Another yeah, one. I, I could attest for that because I take that as well. Uh, me and my mom both do actually. And like, we can't take it. Uh, we have to take it close to bedtime because like, we're going to pass out. <laughs> like it yeah, really yeah. puts us to sleep. It's so good. It's so good. And it's your body needs it, mm -hmm. especially, especially if you're under high stress, especially if you're dealing with anything, you're like, oh Yeah try it out for yourself. You will feel a lot better. Another thing your body needs are B vitamins, your nervous system. I take a B, uh, B vitamin complex. Uh, I was actually given this as a child in liquid form. It does not taste good. It, it's, un, it's not like the magnesium I just described, 
I highly recommend the capsule um, or a pill, but those are also really, really good. Uh, in fact, the one I take is called B stress complex. It's specifically for a stressed immune a stress system. So those are those are just two examples of things that you absolutely should be supplementing if you are under stress. Your body needs it, and it'll help you deal with that. It'll help. It helps your it helps your nervous system, your nerves, and your nervous system in general regulate and be healthy. Mm hmm. What about with gut health? So I'm a kombucha brewer, and so I know like gut health equals brain health. Like it's really you know they work together through the vagus nerve and everything. Um, so what do you, what do you have to say about gut, gut health and how do you like help your clients in really nourishing their gut too? Like, what is something that we can take to ensure that we have proper gut health? Oh, Jessica, we could talk about this for two hours. Okay. Let me see. Oh, totally. <laughs> <laughs> that's amazing. First of all, that you brew your own kombucha. That's, yeah. that's fast. Yeah. Um, regardless of your stress level, I personally think you should be taking probiotics and prebiotics. Kombucha is amazing. Um, basically, we, our guts, when we evolve, when we grow in our mama's bellies, when we're in utero, the, the, the cells that become the brain and the spinal cord are also the same ones that become the gut. So it's actually, what do they call it? Our little brain. They're connected. Mm -hmm. and they're also connected by the vagus nerve, which is part of um, the parasympathetic nervous system. Remember I mentioned that before. It connects the brain, the heart, and the gut. 80% of our nerves are afferent nerves sending responses from our body back to our brain. And the gut is so important in that, and that it, it creates a lot of our um, neurotransmitters for the nervous system. So there's so, there's so much connection. It's like, almost like, duh, like, how do we not, how did we not think about this? How does, how do doctors not suggest this to people? Like take care of your gut when you're under stress, if you're eating crap, if you're drinking alcohol, sugar, caffeine, you're going to destroy your microbiome. Jessica, you know so, so much more probably about this than I do. Your microbiome mm -hmm. are the beneficial bacteria in your gut that help you digest. So it's not just us. We have these little pets, these little buddies mm -hmm. in our guts that help us break down food so that we can have the energy so that we can um, live. And if you're under stress, if you're eating all of that stuff I just mentioned, that destroys the good bacteria and bad bacteria can take over. You can get sick. <clears throat> so you want to support the good bacteria and you do that by probiotics, by adding more bacteria, prebiotics, which is the food they like. I believe it's usually inulin, which is a fiber, but there's other things that they, they really like to keep them happy. If you keep them happy, you're going to stay healthier. They're, they're like one of your defenses against bad bacteria and viruses. So there's so many connections to the gut and I feel like it, they're still discovering it. Mm -hmm. Um, also, like what happens when you get, at least for me, when you get stressed, the first thing that, that you feel it in is usually your belly. Mm -hmm. Upset, indigestion, gas, bloating, um, loss of appetite. Like that's the first place that you feel it. There's a reason for that, especially with kids. If your mm -hmm. kid is experiencing tummy upset, something's bugging them. So the body's right. always speaking to us. There, there is no, when I was going through college and there was still like, oh, you know, there's a, they would still talk about a disconnect between the mind and body. There is no disconnect. The mind mm -hmm. is the body, the body mm -hmm. is the mind. And so like it, when it's unwell, your body is talking to you and it's up to your brain to go, okay, how can I support myself here? I love that. There is no disconnect. So it's really just the way that we're thinking about it. Like we're thinking there's a disconnect, but that's it. Like there really is no disconnect with our body. Yeah. I really I love that. It was like emotional stuff. <clears throat> like I was always mm -hmm. a highly sensitive kid. I would feel emotions deeply and I always felt shame around it, you know, like, mm -hmm. but that is that is who you are. Like your emotions are important. They're not, they're, they're not the only thing. Like sometimes we can get too caught up in like, I am my emotions, especially if like you're depressed, but they're important. And, um, I think it's really, really important to listen to all of what's going on in your body. Mm -hmm. Yeah, for sure. I find it so interesting because when I started learning about like the gut, the brain connection, I started to notice just how, evident that connection is throughout our life. So I do some speaking and 
you know, if, if anybody can remember in school, like doing a speaking event, going up and doing a presentation or something, most often you have to go to the washroom before you do that. <laughs> like you could feel it. Right. And that's kind of like, because you're stressing in your head and your brain signaling like, okay, you need to relieve yourself because we might have to run and we might got to run. Like we might have to run for a while. <laughs> so yeah. let's make sure that we're empty so we can keep going. And so, I don't know. I feel like when you, when you know this and when you understand it and when, when you can kind of see like your body speaking to itself and like how it's functioning, it just kind of brings like this state sense of awe. Like it's really fascinating. Yeah. Yeah. And we're, I feel like we're still discovering stuff, you know, yeah. it's yeah, truly. Yeah, absolutely. So do you think that there's a difference between let's say eating probiotic foods or consuming probiotics food, you know, yogurt, kombucha, kimchi, or a supplement probiotic? Yeah, I do. Um, but I still stand firm and you should supplement regardless. Um, obviously getting it from fermented foods, all the things you mentioned, pickles, yogurt, kombucha, anything fermented is going to have um, nice, nice probiotics. But, you know, unless you're eating them all the time, drinking them all the time, um, I still would, it's just easier to sometimes just also take a really good supplement. And, and the difference between the supplement is like, they, they always talk about how your stomach acid can destroy a lot of them. And some of them have certain coatings and things like that. Um, but I would, I would definitely say load up on both, you know, it's not going to harm you. It's only going to help you. Right. But yes, I do believe, I think kombucha is probably one of, or kefir, like drinking it. It's probably mm -hmm. one of the best ways to get it. Probably one of the most delicious ways, if I could just say <laughs> it out there, <laughs> it's really good. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I have some questions from the listeners today that I want to ask you about stress, if that's okay. Absolutely. Uh, Let's start off with how does stress play a part in weight gain? Oh, good one. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, in, in a nutshell, it messes up our hormonal balance. Um, and if you're not dealing with it, it can make you crave things that are emotionally comforting, fatty, sugar, sugary, salty foods. So, you know, stress eating, it's even a, it's even a term, yeah. um, or drinking. So, and that can put on weight. So in a nutshell, if you're not addressing it, if you're kind of shoving it to the back, which is what I did for many, many years, you know, starting in childhood, I didn't know what was going on with me. And I was prone to anxiety, panic attacks, depression. And so I'd go from the pendulum of like, you know, depression is, looking back over your shoulder and regretting things, anxiety, fear of the future. And you want to be in the present moment right here in the middle of the pendulum. Um, but if you're not present with that, if you're kind of reacting and you're like just grabbing things because you don't feel good on the inside and you're not exercising those calories off, you're going to gain weight. That's my short answer. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Again, we could go on and on about it, but Right. Oh yeah. This topic, I feel like it's almost like a never ending thing. We could be talking for, for so long to really get into like the nitty gritty of all of it. Um, let's see next question, because you mentioned kids before a while back. Um, how would you suggest that parents can minimize their stress when dealing with, you know, kids and the busyness of kids? And if they have, you know, kids with high maintenance and health problems, like how would you recommend being able to manage that like for parents not for the children yeah, stress. for stress yeah, yeah for parents stress I I'm not a parent I'm a dog parent but um I do have nieces and I would say that you know self-care is really important that um I've even did, I babysat my niece the other night she's six I love her to death and I noticed how much I was I'm not around her that much I'm like oh are her needs being met are her, is she okay what does she need and I was like she's fine mm -hmm. she's fine chill <laughs> um you have to have self-care. You have to be able to take care of yourself first. I saw this with my parents, my mom too. She was a stay-at-home mom and she was a wonderful mom, but we were her life. And you you need to have, you know, care for yourself, moments for yourself, whatever that means. Exercise, meditation, getting your nails done, going for walks, time away from the kids. Um, I know that can be hard because children are a 24 seven job and you cannot put them away. <laughs> you know, I can even walk away from my dogs for a little bit and little, little kids, you can't do that. 
But I would say the very first thing is, and I know that's easier said than done, but make room for yourself in your life um, so that you can manage your own stress. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. That's so true. That self-care. Uh, it's actually making me think because you mentioned, so you do a lot of breath work. Like, do you have a breath work technique? Like real quick, I don't know that you're willing to share that maybe, you know, the busy parent who can't because they got kids appointments and I don't know, sports and all of that. Like, is there like something real quick that they can do within like two minutes just to kind of reset that nervous totally. system? The the most, I'm going to say this because any, any of these little somatic tools, when I first read them, I was like, really, what is that going to do? But when you actually do them consistently, when you build up a practice, whether that be a meditation or breath work practice, <clears throat> excuse me, it's doing it over time so that you're, you have that tool and you're, you're bringing your body back down from that into that refractory phase. So like one of the easiest ways, take one hand or two hands, put it on top of your heart, close your eyes and breathe into your hands. And there's so many different breath techniques, but in, for this purpose, we're gonna, we're gonna breathe in for four. We're gonna hold it for four. We're gonna breathe out for four. And we're gonna hold it for four. And that's called box breathing. Um, I don't exactly know why putting your hand over your heart is always like a really good connection to yourself. Mm -hmm. um, it actually works if you consistently do it. The first time, the first few times you do it, you may be like, oh, but, but, you know, this is not helping over time. It actually really does. And then I do teach deeper breath work um, because like I said, those, those little Xanax pills, those were perfect. And you can't, you can't be on those forever. So you have to have those other tools. Mm -hmm. is one of them. Yeah. Yeah. No, I appreciate that. It's kind of like, it's like building the habit of doing that and, I wonder, can you like, is it almost like training your brain to like decompress, get back into the parasympathetic? Yeah, that's exactly what it is. Um, it's, it's a practice, you know, um, just like yoga, just like weight training, just like, mm -hmm. you know, learning another language it's over and over and over again, where you're in control and you're bringing your body back down. You're bringing your, you're bringing yourself into safety. You're reminding mm -hmm. yourself that you're safe, which for most people, we want to run away from our stress. We want to shove it aside. We want to pretend it's not there. We want to eat the chips. We want to, you know, what? J just Binge be watch busy. TV, social media, whatever. <laughs> yeah, and yeah. it's like a lot of that stuff um, is is taking our attention away from being calm. Mm -hmm. So there's all when you when you stack all these little things in your favor to be calm, you're going to see a difference in how you feel and how you're living your life and your happiness quotient. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, like all of the things that we reach for, it's distracting us from actually getting to the root cause, but it's also adding more negative effects, like all of the junk food. And then I'm thinking all of the, like the screen time, like all of those, what is it? The negative or the positive ions that we're getting, like, that's just causing us more stress. And so like yeah. we're reaching for activities to help soothe our stress, but it's actually just making it worse, making it worse. Yeah, exactly. It's Yeah. Interesting. Um, okay. Next question. Do you, do you believe that our belief systems have a role in the stress that we like bring into our lives? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, I love Dr. Joe Dispenza. I just went mm -hmm. to one of his meditation retreats in December. It was life changing. Amazing. I I wow. I feel like his work. I'm, I teach like middle school and high school, and he teaches graduate school. Um, <laughs> and so I've I've his stuff is amazing, and he always yeah. says how you think and how you feel create your personal reality. Mm -hmm. So beliefs are how you think, and um, you can freak out. You can bring on stress just by thought alone. And so it's hard, it's a hard, that's a, that's another practice that to really like rein in how you're thinking and change your thoughts, but it is possible. And so it's another, it's another layer of like looking at how you're going through your world because we, gosh, I mean, we have how many tens of thousands of thoughts a day. Mm -hmm. And Dr. Dispenza says, by the time you're 35, like 90% of them are the same ones that you had yesterday. 
So it's really important to look at how, what you're believing, what you're thinking about yourself, about the world. The world is scary right now. Let's be honest. There's a lot of stuff going on. Mm -hmm. um, and just to, you, you got to take care of your side of the street first. So what you're believing about yourself, about your spouse, about your, your life has a huge impact on not only how you feel, but also what you manifest and bring towards you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you're right. Yeah, that is so spot on because what we think about, like we're we're creating. Mm -hmm. So then, like we can create a lot of that stress within ourselves just by the way that we want to define what it is that we're experiencing. Yeah, I always give this example. Like, if you don't, you know, people I'm sure understand that. But even think about Jessica. Close your eyes for a second. Mm -hmm. Think about biting into like a really cold ice pop, just crunch. Like, if you really mm -hmm. go there, you will feel the chills on your arm. That's mm -hmm. an example. It's like you didn't bite into that ice pop, but your body will have that response. Yeah. So I have sensitive teeth. I feel it in my teeth. Not a good <laughs> feeling. <laughs> I do too. Yeah. Yeah. So it's, it's amazing how that it's, it's true. You know, your, your brain doesn't mm -hmm. know the difference. Right. Yeah. Doesn't. Yeah. Yeah. Is there a correlation between happiness and stress? And like, can we still feel stress, even though like we, we really want to do something like, is there, can stress be a good thing that can help us, you know, achieving our goals, which will ultimately create the happiness that we seek? I don't think happiness comes from achieving. Mm. I, th I, I could be wrong, but I really believe like happiness is a practice I've been to places in the world, Thailand, for example, people are happy there. They're walking around smiling. Um, where else? Greece. People are happy there. I know these are very warm places. <laughs> They're not walking around worrying about, I feel like it's very American to be like, well, I'm going to be happy when I have the house and the spouse and the kids and the dog and the car and the, and the social media credit and the book publishing deal. No. That's why a lot of people get to those point, points and they're st still miserable because it's not about that. I remember hearing, um, oh, oh, I don't want to mess this up. It's not about the journey or the destination. It's about the company you keep. And mm -hmm. I love that mm -hmm. because if you're not comfortable in yourself and happy with who you are and proud of who you are, and supportive and loving of who you are. It doesn't matter how many accolades you get from the outside world, you're still gonna feel vacuous inside. So to go back to your question, is there a correlation between stress and happiness? Yes, because if you're super stressed or panicky or ang anxious, you're not gonna feel happy, but um, they're not mutually exclusive. So as you said, like, can stress bring us to greater things? Absolutely. Stress in and of itself. So let's use the example of like a, um, doing a bicep curl with a dumbbell. That's a physical stress to your bicep. However, that weight is actually making it go strong, grow stronger. So you need that, that physical stress. Remember, we went, talked about the six zones of stress. You need that physical stress to make that muscle grow. And you can apply that example to a lot of things. Um, you maybe in your work, you need the you know the challenge to rise to an opportunity to do a big presentation or a speaking event. You have to overcome that, and and you will feel more accomplished after that. You will grow as a person. So, uh, you know, yes, yeah, stress in of, of itself actually leads us to grow, but it's our how we how we manage that as we're growing, and also get rid of the stuff that like social media stress, like comparing ourselves to other people mm -hmm. on there, that's not helping you grow. Sorry. It's not, <laughs> it's just, it's just making you feel badly about yourself. It, yeah. I experience it all the yeah. time. I'm not, um, personally, uh, I don't like social media. It, it, I look at people and I'm like, I, they say they're living amazing lives. I know the truth. They're not, right. but, but you know, um, and I find it interesting that like Facebook and social media was started by people that like Facebook as an example, you know, he had problems making friends, yet he has developed something that has changed how we relate to each other. I find that really interesting. So I'm going off on a tangent. Yes. Uh, <laughs> I hope I answered your question. <laughs> no, you did actually. And I love the way that you put it because I hadn't looked at it that way, but 
you're right. Like it's a stressor to get out of our comfort zone. Like that feeling that like that, you know, that uncomfortable feeling that we feel is a form of stress. And yeah. we always say, you're not going to grow unless you get over the comfort zone or, you know, oh, whatever, move past it. And so it makes total sense that yes, stress could actually help you grow and help you reach new, you know, new heights. Because if you didn't feel that stress, like stress kind of moves you to change, right? Or moves you to take action, doesn't it? Like if you didn't have that, then would you even feel a reason <laughs> to move? Like when now I'm thinking like fight or flight and all of that, but like, you know, anyways, interesting. <laughs> uh, no, I, I, I don't know. <clears throat> Probably not. I feel like there's a lot of like analogies that could all come into play right here. I'm thinking of like so many things, but you can relate. I, but I, stress. Think the, I think the important thing to know though, is like achieving those things. Okay. So, so let's take your speaking engagements as an example, like you get mm -hmm. through it, you get better at them, you get to the other side. And is it a point where you're like, well, I need more and bigger and keynote. And I need, you know, versus like, I'm happy that I did that. I, you know, I had someone come up to me afterwards and thank me. Like, it's the little things, mm, mm -hmm. not the journey and the destinations. You know, it's the little things. It's the little enjoyments along the way. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. What, did, what, how did you put that? It's the connections you make. Along not the, the journey way. or the destinations. It's the company you keep. The company you keep. Yeah. I remember, I I remember where I heard that. I was like, I love that. Yeah. Because it's beautiful. As Americans and Westerners are always like, go, go, go. It's like, mm -hmm. and I feel like the Europeans know this a lot better than we do. They're like, no, let's enjoy. Let's slow down. <laughs> right. Let's take yeah. The vacation, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Susie, thank you so much for everything that you shared today and for answering all of those questions. I'm wondering, do you have any last words that you would like to share with the audience today? Um, just thank you so much for having me. And if they're interested in, in learning more about what I, what I teach, they can go to susiehardy.com and they can get that free video tutorial of my number one tool to okay. it, it, it it's very quick and it eliminates stress and anxiety like that it's very easy to teach and learn you can teach it to your children it's wonderful okay amazing well thank you so much i will be including that link in the show notes so be sure to check that out thank you for your time today susie it was so great talking with you my pleasure thanks for having me